Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Stanford University. Welcome to Beauty of God, our conference on preaching, worship, and the arts. We are so thankful that you've chosen to spend this afternoon and tomorrow with us. This conference for us, and I'm speaking on behalf of the team at the Center for Worship and the Arts and Beeson's Preaching Institute, directed by Dr. Mike Pascarello, who is here with us as well. Um, wave your hand, Mike. Thank you. Um, we had been planning this conference for a while, and then COVID hit, so we rescheduled, and then COVID hit again, so we rescheduled, and so finally we are very thankful the doors are open and we are able to host you and our guests um, here on campus for this event. Um, again, a couple of days of thinking about the beauty of God and the ways in which beauty has the power and the capacity to, to nourish us in our faith to help us find meaning in our faithful lives and in the lives of worship, both individually and corporately in our communities of faith. That's one of the goals that we hope um, many sessions today will be helping us think about and both again individually and collectively um, throughout a variety of sessions and ways to engage that we have for us um, over the next couple of days. It's my delight to introduce Dr. John Whitfleet, who is our opening um, speaker. Dr. John Whitfleet is director of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, where he is also professor of worship theology and congregational ministry there at Calvin University and Calvin Seminary. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Whitfleet, for being with us. He will be um, opening our conference today with his plenary session and also help um, closing it before our final worship service. And I was just speaking with um, John before our session, and um, he, will, he has a gift for helping bring together many thoughts um, and kind of guiding the conversation. Um, and that's one reason that we were really hopeful that he would be able to join us in that capacity. Um, so again, thank you. We don't want to forget to thank Lily Endowment for their generous support of this conference. And so, um, again, the Center for Worship and the Arts, Beeson's Preaching Institute, um, both exist because of the generous funding of Lily Endowment. And so please uh, find ways to express gratitude to them, and, and we are very grateful uh, for their underwriting support of this event. A couple of logistical things before we um, continue in this session. One is not actually so logistical. Professor Joe Corey, would you stand and let everyone know who you are right from the beginning? This is Professor Joe Corey. He has created artwork that was especially commissioned for this conference. The painting is titled Soli Deo Gloria, and it appears at the end of the hall um, from Beeson Commons. So actually, if you just exit out this room here and you'll find yourself there's a long hallway but the wonderful painting that is at the end there of the hallways was especially commissioned for this conference although it will also um, be displayed permanently here at Beeson Divinity School which is the building where we are currently um, so thank you Joe for your work um, and please do go see it. Um, Joe was, we'll talk more about the inspiration later on for the painting, but Joe was inspired by the themes of this conference in guiding that artwork. And so please do take a moment during our next break to go and see it um, because it was especially created for this event. Let me um, guide us in prayer now before we ask Dr. Whitfleet to come and guide us in this session. God, for all the things of today and tomorrow, we give you thanks. We pause to ask your blessings on the efforts of everyone gathered here. And as we pause, we remember that this time is, is really a luxury that many in our world cannot, cannot afford. And so we ask that you would help us become good stewards of the gift that is this conference the learning and sharing that goes on. And so over the next several hours, would you give us the grace to give to one another and to receive from one another so that we might serve you and your world. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good afternoon to you all. It is so good to be here at Samford, a joy after many months of planning and preparation. And I'd like to express my 
Great thanks to Dr. Emily Snyder's Andrew, Dr. Mike Pascarello. Thank you for putting this topic before us. And what a gift to be in a space that makes clear solo Deo Gloria is the point of what we do. It's a gift. I'm very much looking forward to the conversations we'll share um, in the break times, in the meals, the different sessions, and the way that we'll weave together uh, opportunities for learning. And it's already great to know that there are people here from congregations that are very large, very small, many from throughout the South, guests that I know were flying in from out of town. And I'm particularly grateful to be here, uh, not as the only person from Calvin University. Uh, I am so thrilled, actually, that we have uh, two staff colleagues and 10 of our student worship apprentices who are in the back. So this is like a little shout out. Raise your hand, Calvin crew here. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to participate in a partnership that has emerged over many years. Uh, north, South, you know, the Reformed types and the Baptist types, it's, it's this fabulous experience of Christian unity, and we're delighted, absolutely delighted. In your bag, you will find a copy of the handout for this opening presentation, and I invite you to turn to that now. It includes uh, an outline, and all you'll need for this first session is to pay attention to uh, the very first page. And then as the conference unfolds, it could be that some of the material, some of the quotations and images and other things that are supplemental will become germane as we go, and I'll allude to a few of those along the way. As I was preparing uh, this session, I kept coming back, I felt compelled to keep coming back to Psalm 111. It's a gem of a psalm, a poetic masterpiece. It's an acrostic poem. So in the Hebrew language, there are 22 lines, and each one starts with the subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It, was, it would be as if, in English, the first line begins with A, the next with B, the next with C, the next with D, and so on. It gives evidence as an acrostic poem with a lot of attention in the Hebrew to exactly how many syllables are in each line. It gives lots of evidence of being a finely crafted piece of poetry. It gives every evidence of having gone through more than one draft. It's beautiful, it's compelling, and it is spot on with the theme of this conference. And so as we begin, I'd invite us as a tone setting action to ground everything we do from here throughout the end of the conference in this gift of God's Holy Spirit in the Word of God. And so I'd invite you to stand, if you would, please. And I'd invite us to do something that many maybe congregations won't do, but surely in this place we can do it. And it is to actually speak the entirety of this acrostic psalm together with great joy, declaring before the world and to ourselves these words we say. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, he provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people, he ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. And may everything that we talk about and explore together in these next days be like commentary, be like footnotes on that wonderful text. There is a sort of um, majesty of speaking those words together 
And I, as I was preparing, sitting here ahead, I couldn't help but think that uh, Athanasius, who's right there on the ceiling, would be thrilled that we would begin a conference by using these words. It was Athanasius, along with Chrysostom, who, by the way, is right here, uh, who loved uh, using the Psalms as a way of forming the people of God. And they were always asking the question, how are the Psalms inviting us to say things to God that do not come naturally to us on our own, that we need to be taught to say, that we need to grow into over time? And really, their invitation to us would be, as we continue to pray our way toward worship that more faithfully extols the glory of God, draw on these amazing spirit-gifted texts every step of the way. In light of Psalm 111, I have four questions to put on the table for us for this conference. And they're alluded to in the description on this outline that I'll use uh, to guide my reflections in this session. The first question, it's very simple, and yet it's absolutely central to all that our conference organizers have invited us into. The first question is simply this, how can we, God's chosen, called pastoral leaders and those apprenticing for this kind of work, and how can all of us as disciples of Jesus Christ uh, be very intentional in desiring, in seeking, in looking for, in listening for, in pondering, in delighting, in remembering, in extolling, and in testifying to the beauty of God. How can we make that intentional act of recentering beauty a hallmark of our work? Now you notice that I sort of piled up the verbs there because I do think there is, the, um, there is something about this topic on the beauty of God that invites that kind of overflow of language. There is something about the Psalms and the prophets that often when they get near topics of beauty and glory express that kind of overflow. And so when I was finishing the draft of the handout, you'll notice that I got just rather excited about that list and I couldn't leave any one of those words out. We want to desire to seek, to look for, to listen for, to ponder, to delight, to remember, to extol, to testify. And you'll notice that that's the approach that sound takes too, right? All those verbs in blue that you can follow on the left-hand side, extolling the Lord and pondering divine deeds and delighting in them and finding ourselves being called into remembrance, which leads to the fear of the Lord and obedience and praise. There is a kind of overflow that we want to call ourselves into. This is an aspect of worship leadership and a part of the conversation of worship renewal that strangely enough is taken for granted too often. In our work at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, it's been our great joy to uh, invite people into uh, a grants program where we receive from congregations grant proposals related to the renewal of Christian worship practices. And it is absolutely wonderful. Grants come from large churches, small churches, churches in a wide variety of cultural contexts and denominational settings. And many grant proposals um, uh, wonderfully attend to the beauty and glory of God. But many times what we notice is that it is an easy thing to say, but then to make the vast majority of our efforts focused on worship renewal, focused on other things. Taking for granted the overwhelming and compelling uh, nature of God's glory and beauty. So that worship becomes in, in, uh, flattened or less able to speak to the deepest spiritual needs that people provide. Worship can become so often about other things than the beauty and glory of God, unless we nurture and encourage it. It's for that reason that when we worked a few years ago on a list of core convictions that guide our work, we moved to the top of the list, attention to the beauty and glory of God. And it is why I think we feel such kindred spirits with the work that is being done here the very intentional act of putting this um, theme before us. 
But it's not just the theme that's important. Of course, what this conference is about beautifully is taking this theme and this awareness, this overwhelming and beautiful gift of divine beauty, what the Spirit allows us to perceive, and connecting it profoundly with each and every actions of worship. And so along the way, in these next um, a day and a half or so, um, I look forward to learning from the breakouts, from the discussions, what does it mean to have preaching that is not only beautiful, but which calls attention to the beauty and glory of God. Preaching that leads not just to repentance, preaching that leads not just to obedience, but preaching that also is doxological, that leads to praise. And what a wonderful gift to have a recent book of Dr. Pascarello on the beauty of preaching to guide and inspire that conversation. And I look forward to learning with you and from you about how the beauty and glory of God can be central to our practices of music making. Surely we want to bring praise and prayer through song for the richness of the salvation that God has provided us in and through Jesus. And we always want to do it in ways that make the glory of God more luminous, more uh, explicit part of our own awareness before and during and after worship. We want to have that same conversation with respect to visual arts, and what a wonderful thing to have that be an integral part of the conference, even as it is in the space around us. But it connects with every aspect of worship. Praying for the needs of the world in public prayers of intercession are as much about the glory of God as is preaching and is the selection of music. Having us remember to pray for and lament places in which the beauty and glory of God is absent or where people are not attentive to it or not able to perceive it. And explicitly praying that the beauty and glory of God will be evident to all of us is surely a central part of public prayer. So whether we are talking about baptisms or the Lord's Supper, whether we are talking about preaching or public prayer, whether we're talking about music or the arts, that question of divine beauty is one of the central and most life-giving questions to ask. It ought to be central, in other words, as we think about preparing worship for the people of God. As I was thinking about today, my um, heart was drawn back to a hymn that I remember growing up singing. The text is one of the supplemental texts that's provided. It's a hymn by Frederick Faber. I'm so glad I grew up singing this text. It, it goes like this. My God, how wonderful thou art. Thy majesty, how bright. How beautiful thy mercy seat in depths of burning light. How wonderful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be. Thine endless wisdom, boundless power, and awesome purity. There is something so compelling about inviting attention to nothing less than the pure beauty of a living God. What a gift. I can't tell you how often the Spirit drew me back to the memory of that text over the months of preparing for this conference. It's important that this first question be asked as we think about preparing worship for the people. But it is also really important as we think about preparing the people for worship. So just think about that combination for a minute. Preparing worship for the people but also preparing the people for worship. 
Those are the two interconnected opportunities that all of us in pastoral ministry have. I don't know about you, but in my experience, it's easy to spend a lot of time thinking about preparing worship for the people. To plan a service, to choose the music, to prepare a sermon, to prepare or gather or curate artwork, to shape the prayers, to make sure the PowerPoint slides are presented and the programs are printed and the service is advertised and the microphones are in the right spot and all the details work out, um, it, it's an all-consuming business, right? It can be. And yet, where pastoral worship leadership really comes into its own happens when we are not only doing that, but also preparing the people for worship. When we're saying to a kid that we meet at a soccer game on Tuesday afternoon, you know, next Sunday we're going to sing a song and I hope you'll be listening for it. Because if you say that to one person a day all week long, more people come to church looking for and listening for something that next Sunday, if you've had that thoughtful connection. It's the act of putting out a social media post three days in advance that say, can't wait, Sunday's coming, and we invite you as you get ready for Sunday to pay attention to this or that along the way. And when someone complains about something that hasn't gone right, it's an opportunity to prepare that person for worship too, to learn from the criticism, certainly, but also to have a conversation about worship's meaning and purpose. So it's in those little conversations all week long and our intentional acts of preparation that we also have a chance to put in action the theme that we're talking about. Now, right at this point is when I have the opportunity to quote from one of my favorite people, I'm contractually obliged, you see, to quote from John Calvin at least once in this talk. And, uh, you know, you always worry a little bit, now how's that going to go in a different environment, those of us who leave Calvin University and we start talking about John, how's that going to go? But I will just say I took great comfort in the fact that one of the best visual paintings ever of John Calvin is right above me in the space, right, right up there. And he, when you get the chance afterwards, just realize he's... He's beautifully represented. Here's what Calvin said at the front end of his reforming efforts. It's in a document called The Necessity of Reforming the Church, and he's addressing a wide audience about why the reform of worship ought to be central um, uh, to his ministry in Geneva. And he writes, God's benefits toward ourselves we extol as eloquently as we can. The people should be incited, are incited to reverence God's majesty, render due homage to his greatness, feel due gratitude for his mercy, and unite in showing forth his praise. I love it. Calvin, you see, is piling on the verbs there too. And he does this time and time again. He's one of the best verb piler honors I know when he gets talking about the beauty and glory of God. But then here's where Calvin brought it home to ordinary families. Families that were just trying to figure out how to say the Lord's Prayer in French for the very first time because they had grown up speaking it in Latin after the Reformation came to town. So Calvin assembled the, the new practice of sung psalms into a little book and he sent it home with people and he began to invite children and then the congregation to sing praise. But Calvin put with it a little teaching but he wasn't just preparing psalms for people to sing. He was preparing the people to sing the psalms. And what he said was this. The practice of singing may extend more widely. And then what he meant by that is even than our singing in church. For it is even in our homes and the fields an incentive for us, as it were, an organ to praise God. And why would we do this in our homes and in the fields? to lift up our hearts to him, to console us by meditating upon his virtue, goodness, wisdom, and justice, that which is more necessary than one can say. Calvin put the beauty and glory of God as an agenda for the people's praise in their homes and in their fields. It was as if he was saying, take the songs we sing on Sunday and turn them into a Spotify list that you live by all week long, that you play and sing along with in your cars all week long, as you exercise at the gym, that would sort of be a Calvinian translation for life in the 21st century. 
Everything we do over these next uh, hours is reflecting on not only preparing worship for the people, but also preparing the people for worship. And now to question number two. As we do this work, not just any definition of beauty will do. Oh, there are many definitions of beauty out there. There's the beauty depicted by Hollywood movies. There is natural beauty. There is the beauty of the world around us. There are all kinds of conceptions of beauty. But it is essential that as we have this conversation that we are converted, that we are challenged and sanctified in our understanding of beauty. And we constantly need to have this term, like every single term we use to describe God, redefined. Redefined for us in light of the revelation of the glory of God that we see in the face of Jesus Christ. This can begin with Psalm 111. Psalm 111 includes a lot of different dimensions of God's beauty. They're all there in green. Because beauty is either an attribute of God or a, a description of the attributes of God as they all come together. Systematic theologians, we could debate about the pros and cons of which way to do it. But in any case, all the attributes of God hang together and every one of them is beautiful, and God's beauty surely cannot be thought about apart from the greatness of God, the righteousness of God, the graciousness of God, the compassion of God, the faithfulness of God, the justice of God, the trustworthiness of God, the uprightness of God, the holiness of God. This is not even intended to be a systematic theology of the doctrine of God, and yet it's a pretty wonderful outpouring of adjectives that give us different dimensions of the beauty of glory of God. And really, this composite list challenges us. My guess is that if we were to take the song list of music we love to sing in our congregations, and we were to try to do a little song diet analysis, and we were to look for Songs we sing about the greatness of God. Songs we sing about the compassion of God. Songs we sing about the justice of God. Songs we sing about the uprightness of God. Some of these adjectives would register pretty high on our song diet list. We do really well. And some of these adjectives, not quite so much. Yeah? And so it is an exercise I warmly recommend to all of us. I see a few smiles because I know that at Calvin, uh, worship apprentices with our staff do a little song diet analysis um, reflections as part of the work, which I'm a big fan of. And it, there are many ways to do it, of course, but one beautiful way is asking what are the dimensions of God's beauty and glory that we already love to sing about? And what are the dimensions of God's beauty and glory that we need to sing about more? Preachers, what are the dimensions of God's beauty and glory that you preach about instinctively? They're in your stump sermon. They're in every hospital room visit. They're in every meeting you lead. They're the dimensions of God's beauty and glory that come naturally. And what are the dimensions of God's beauty and glory that, um, that are an invitation for you to stretch and grow? ones that come straight out of the inspired words of Scripture, but invite us to grow. It's so important to know that divine beauty includes both greatness and compassion. It includes both righteousness and justice, never one without the other. They go together all the way through the Psalms and the Prophets. And yet we have work to do to ensure that all those dimensions of God's beauty and glory are front and center. But there is even more redefinition work that is needed. And it has to do with the cross of Jesus Christ. It is easy to talk about beauty and think that it omits suffering. Beauty, a definition of beauty that does not include wounded love, is a definition of beauty that can create all kinds of problems. The beauty of God revealed in Jesus Christ is surely not only a beauty that is sublime, 
but also the beauty that includes wounded sacrificial love for the sake of the world, both and. This is precisely the message of the transfiguration narrative. There's a place where beauty shows up in the Bible. Beauty shows up on the mountain. The glory of God revealed, the voice of God declaring uh, the, the beauty of, of Jesus Christ, the Son. Peter and the apostles thought that was all that beauty was. But what the gospel writers teach us is that there is another dimension of divine beauty and that one of the most beautiful things in the world is Jesus setting his face like flint, walking down that mountain toward Jerusalem in self-sacrificial love. I was thinking about many ways to illustrate this ahead of this uh, lecture. And by God's grace, I said, um, oh, my talk is going to be in Hodges Chapel. I should click on that again. Friends, we are sitting inside of a space that tells the story of cruciform beauty. And I don't know about you, when I walk into this space, I think sublime, transcendent. I love the echo, by the way. It is just wondrous to behold the crafts, the craftsmanship, the artistry, the sense of intimacy yet still expansiveness that is here. But let us not lose sight of all of the marks related to suffering and violence and martyrdom that this space tells. Every single pew, the on you stay, Lamb of God, marked. The story of Jesus told in the paintings, and when you have a chance later to be able to see the foot washing crucifixion, uh, to have stories of martyrdom be so prominent, Jan Hus right here, Bonhoeffer right here, the symbols uh, on the back wall of the apostles, many of whom, beautiful gold imagery, and yet the meaning of the symbols often points to violence as their sacrificial um, lives are remembered. In Jesus Christ, we learn that the beauty of God includes redemptive, suffering love. It's supremely true in ways that are completely unique in the person of Jesus Christ. But it is also true in the lives of those that seek to imitate Christ through self-giving, sacrificial love. Care workers in hospice units, care workers in AIDS units, care workers that helped us through hospice, people that um, experience homelessness and those who help them, and some of the most beautiful worship examples that happen, I have experienced, for example, in a rest home when my grandmother passed her 101st birthday. And we had the chance to have a worship service with only five or six residents of her community, uh, family members, and a few caregivers that would gather on Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., singing Amazing Grace and hymns that would be known and loved. And I think the beauty and glory of God consists of worshiping in this place, and it also consists of worship in that residential care facility. Both together give us a vision of what the beauty and glory of God can look like as we seek to imitate it, testify about it, call attention to it. But it only makes sense if we are willing to have redefined for us our sense of what the beautiful is. May it be that the cross of Jesus Christ is never ever viewed as an exception to divine beauty, but rather as a supreme example of it. And then all of it comes together in powerful and profound ways. Sometimes that means, incidentally, that in worship we call attention to the um, upside-down nature of divine beauty. Uh, later in your packet, there is a hymn text by John Bell that I love to use because it is an intentional 
redefinition kind of hymn. It's meant to be a lilting Advent carol. Lift up your heads, eternal gates, alleluia. See how the King of glory waits, alleluia. The Lord of hosts is drawing near. The Savior of the world is here, alleluia. It's joyful. It's about the glory of the coming of Jesus Christ. But then John gets a little, little sermonic here in this next verse. But, not in arms or battle dress, God comes a child amidst distress. No mighty armies shield the way, only coarse linen, wool, and hay. And then he leans even further. God brings a new face to the brave, and I love this line. God redefines who best can save. Not those whose power relies on threat, terror, or torture, destruction, or debt. God's matchless and majestic strength in all its height, depth, breadth, and length now is revealed its power to prove by Christ protesting. <laughs> no, God is love. That is a redefinition kind of hymn. And it's one strategy that is powerful in preaching or in visual art or in music, in any art form that is a part of worship, to look for occasionally those moments of explicit attention to the redefinition that is needed. Now, by the way, I just couldn't pass this up. I think there was an experience of this during the Queen's funeral that was broadcast recently. So I thought, you know, this is going to be the worship service seen by more people than any other worship service in the history of the planet, you know, whatever it was, how many hundreds of millions of people. So I thought, I'm going to get up for it. So at 6 a.m., I got myself up to watch the live broadcast of the Queen's funeral. And, and I was thinking to myself, and there they all were at Westminster Abbey at about noon. And I had just heard the commentator say, the Queen herself helped pick all the hymns. And we got, like, basically right into the main part of the service, and the first big hymn after the procession was the hymn, The Day Thou Gavest, Lord Is Ended. <laughs> so for me, I'm like, it's a little early in the morning at 6.30 to be singing this hymn. And I think it was a little unusual there in Westminster Abbey, too. Yeah? Now, of course, the end of a life is like the fading of the day. There was a sort of metaphoric significance about it. But I think there was a twinkle in the eye of the queen when she picked this hymn. So they sang it so beautifully and majestically. The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. The darkness falls at thy behest. To thee our morning hymns ascended. Thy praise shall sanctify our rest. And you go on in this vein. But then you get to the end. And it was right as the TV cameras panned on the royal family that the entire congregation sang these words. So be it, Lord, thy throne shall never, like earth's proud empires, pass away. Thy kingdom stands and grows forever till all thy creatures own thy sway. And it was actually wonderful because the whole congregation was saying, you know, actually, the pomp of royalty is not all there is. Oh, no, no. This is all going to fade away. And I sort of thought to myself, yeah, the queen preached her last sermon by picking that hymn to start the service. Now, you feel that there's a little reversal going on there, yeah? And I'll just say, those of us in pastor worship leadership need to be careful as we do this reversal, as we choose texts like John Bell's, as we keep insisting that glory is glorious and glory includes both the sublime and suffering. And it's one of the things we can explore together how to do that uh, pastorally and thoughtfully all the way through. Question number three. Question number three has to do with how it is that we connect our art forms in all of this, the practice of worship. And the question is really, how can we learn to look and to listen through? 
and then to savor and extol and testify about the beauty and glory of God. And here I'd like to reflect a, a few minutes with you about an iconic approach to worship in the arts and especially to the liturgical arts. So much of this space is inspired by the artistic work of the first centuries of Christianity, first leading up to the Reformation, as well as, at many points, extolling the beauties of the Reformation. And in the first centuries of the church, it was especially Eastern Christianity that came to cherish the practice of iconography as central to its acts of worship and walk into any orthodox worship space and icons will be front and central in a key dimension of public worship. I remember walking into an orthodox um, uh, congregation uh, some years ago and one of the things that I said in prefacing my first question to the person who was hosting us, I, I, I wanted to commend the artwork in the space. And I just said, I just love looking at all these icons. And our docent stopped me and said, oh no, sir, we do not look at icons. We look through icons. Think about that. We do not just look at icons. We look through icons. With that in mind, hear these powerful words from Psalm 63. The psalmist writes, So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. We could sit in this space and we could say, we have beheld amazing works of art in this space. Or we could learn to testify, we looked upon the beauty and the glory of God in this space. I actually don't think that comes naturally, though. I think it's something we need to work at. And so I actually would invite you and to join me over these next days in noticing those experiences of worship where we do look through, where we do listen through music, listen through the words that are preached, and we come away saying, we beheld the beauty and glory of God more clearly. I, I sort of can't help. I do have one more John Calvin for you on this one. Listen to what Calvin said of the Lord's Supper. The believer, Calvin writes, when he or she sees the sacraments with his or her own eyes, does not halt at the physical sight of them, but by those steps rises up in devout contemplation to those lofty mysteries which lie hidden in the sacraments. Later on in that same passage, Calvin refers to the Eucharist as the true icon of Jesus Christ. And he actually uses the Greek word from his favorite Eastern Orthodox theologian and drops it right in there. Notice what Calvin is doing. Calvin is saying that seeing at the Lord's Supper matters. In fact, it's astonishing how much Calvin talked about eyesight at the Lord's Supper. He referred to the experience of the Lord's Supper as our encounter with the visible word of God at one point, quoting from Augustine. He said, when people gather around this table, we look at the elements. We see each other as we gather. We see the bread, we see the cup, and then we taste the bread and the cup. But in our act of seeing, in, in our act of tasting, our attention is not on the bread and the cup. We are setting our minds on things above as we do this. And so write my question number three, Colossians 3, verse 1, that every time we encounter liturgical art, every time we encounter preaching, every time we encounter music, we are invited to Yes, listen to the music and see the artwork and hear the words, but we are always invited to listen through them to perceive the beauty and glory of God. 
how do we invite people to do this, though? And how do we practice it ourselves? Here's a discipline I'd like to recommend, and it's a very ordinary one. And it's a discipline for the, um, for the car ride home after church, or the walk back home after a church service. What is it that we talk about or think about in the car ride home, in the walk home after a church service? Funny sermon illustration today, wasn't it there, as the pastor got started? Kids were cute today when they came up for the children's moment. Um, I love the last song we sing, or I don't love the last song we sing. Yeah, there are all kinds of things we talk about in the car ride home. Here's the question I'd invite all of us to reflect on. In fact, I'd invite all of us to reflect on that through the worship we experience at this conference. The question is, where did we perceive God's beauty and glory in what we experience? How is it that the Spirit graced us to see and hear something beautiful about the beauty and glory of God? In other words, we have to be explicit about learning to speak that way. Those of us who lead worship uh, have many stories we can tell about what people say to us after church. I remember preaching some years ago and shaking hands with people after church and about 17 people in a row said to me, nice sermon, pastor. Nice sermon, pastor. Nice sermon, pastor. I want to say I'm grateful for every one of those 17 people. But there was a little part of me that wanted to scream and say, that was not a nice sermon at all. <laughs> it was a prophetic sermon. It was a challenging sermon. It was a disturbing sermon. It cut me to the core, but it was not a nice sermon after all. Uh, early in my time at Calvin, I conducted a choir, and after the church service, someone said to me, that was the most symmetrical choir procession I have ever seen. <laughs> and then, someone said to me, later that same day, I'm so grateful for that music this day. I lost my spouse six months ago, and somehow through that music, I was able to pray, really, pray for the first time. And I thought, now there, what a gift that was to me. So in the room, we have some preachers who are going to be preaching these next few days. So here's my invitation to all of us. We have some musicians. We have an artist who's generously done work. So let's like see if we can together make this practice that when we receive these gifts, that we are able to practice what it's like to say to each other, and th to those who lead us, thank you. Your song helped me perceive the beauty of God in this new way. You helped us encounter this dimension of God's beauty in a beautiful way. And then here's the wonderful thing about life in the Spirit. Sometimes the beauty and glory of God will come to us, and it will be entirely in spite of the sermon that was preached, and entirely in spite of the song that was sung or the artwork that was placed before us. I, however, am not recommending that we always have to testify to the person involved that that is the case. <laughs> but we can still, with a twinkle in our eye, celebrate that sometimes God's Spirit reminds us calls to our attention and awareness something of God's beauty and glory in powerful ways, even in spite of the sermons and songs and artworks on a given day. And that brings me to the fourth and final point, or the uh, in question that I want to put before us. And this question, I have to tell you, comes from Psalm 112. We won't read the entire text right now. Psalm 112 is an exquisite piece of poetry that sits next to the exquisite piece of poetry that is Psalm 111. 
I remember I said Psalm 111, 22 lines. It's an acrostic in the Hebrew Bible, the A, B, C, Ds of the beauty and glory of God. And Psalm 112 is the same, an acrostic, 22 lines in the Hebrew poetry, the A, B, uh, C, and D. But when you read Psalm 112, you realize it's like an echo, a bookend. Psalm 111 is the beauty of God. Psalm 112 is the beauty of godliness. The focus shifts dramatically. Psalm 111 is about God. Psalm 112 is about the saint of God. There is a powerful pivot, actually, at the end of 111 that makes the move to the, to the beginning of Psalm 112. When Psalm 111 ends, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then Psalm 112 picks it up. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commandments. And then you'll notice that all of these adjectives that had been there in Psalm 111 come back. Many adjectives that had been used to describe God now become used to describe the godly. Their righteousness, graciousness, compassion, righteousness, justice, and so on. It's, it's like a little workshop in the communicable attributes of God. And it's all there in the poetry. And so the question is, for all of us who lead pastorally, you see, it's not just are we going to talk a lot about the beauty and glory of God. It's also are we going to imitate it and participate in it. These two things go together. We could preach fabulous, iconic sermons about the beauty and glory of God, but not live it. We can lead music that is as beautiful as Frederick Faber's hymn or text, but if we do it in a way that actually undermines these very adjectives, we actually don't live into the promise that these psalms are holding up for us. And so the question is whether we can be trained, humbled, apprentice, and sanctified to this very same vision. To be image bearers of God is to reflect the beauty and glory of God in our lives. It is a high and holy and remarkable calling. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Natalie Carnes has written two amazing books on beauty. She's a professor at Baylor. I highly recommend them. In her book, simply entitled On Beauty, A Theological Engagement with Gregory of Nyssa, she offers this reflective paragraph. Training into perceiving Gregory of Nyssa's vision of beauty is a lifelong process that engages every sense of our body and spirit, that requires cultivating relationships of love with our neighbor, it includes our membership in a community named the church. To ask how we become the kind of people who can perceive the beauty rightly is inevitably, for Gregory of Nyssa, to ask how the Holy Spirit makes us the kind of people who see beauty rightly. I love it that we have a conference on worship convened by leadership here at Samford that has put the beauty of God high up the priority list, number one. Okay, But now what I'd like to make sure we also do is to put the beauty of godly pastoral leadership like exhibit 1B, high up the list. This is really hard to do, I think, in a world of, um, in a world in which celebrity and in which leaders that sort of by definition can only succeed if we call attention to ourselves, in a world of social media curating the self, is so prominent. It is really hard to do. Some of the most poignant writing that I've been reading in the past year or so has really been writing that challenges this um, temptation, 
especially related to worship. Chuck DeGroat, professor at Western Seminary, Howard, Michigan, a book on narcissism. Caitlin Beatty, a new book on celebrity and Christian community. Um, uh, Kelly Capick, a wonderful book about um, simply receiving the gift of being human and acknowledging our limitation. A wonderful book with the title uh, Low, Antho uh, Low Anthropology by a theologian and pastoral leader from Virginia who, who writes about how all of our culture seems to fan the, the largeness of the human pastoral leader of all kinds and then reflects on the dangers that that brings to us and those around us. I am profoundly grateful for celebrities that handle it well and they're there. It's wonderful. But there is something in our culture that needs a lot of resistance in order to really live with the vision of Psalm 112. And I invite us to, to reflect on that over these days. So here, in summary, is our opportunity. How can we prepare worship for the people that extols the beauty of God, constantly refines our vision for what is beautiful, notice and affirm how uh, artworks that people experience iconically, transparently, and to do all this in ways that participate in the virtuous paths of godliness. And, like a mirror, not only preparing worship for the people, but also preparing the people of God by inviting them into lifelong practices of savoring beauty, explicitly inviting them into the practice of redefinition and of taking delight at moments where they can experience it, even in a royal funeral, inviting them to notice and affirm iconic experiences of liturgical arts that they have, and even to talk that way to the minister and the musician after church on Sunday, and to celebrate all the ways that they themselves show forth the beauty of godliness and receive God's blessings for it. I'm so excited to be here. I look forward to the conversation. Uh, what a joy. Thank you so much. May God's spirit grace us all with the conversations that follow. So thank you.